Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the City Forest Park and to the Senior Center. This is the second environmental seminar that we have. We're going to have four this year, but this is the second. The first one was a couple months ago. It was focused on coyotes, and it is, the link for it is on my website. It's on a handout over here on the table. Make sure that before you leave, you get one of each okay. handout. And one of the handouts is a description of the seminar series. And on the back of it is a printout of my video webpage, where the link to the Coyote workshop seminar is. And we also recently had a composting oh. seminar from the county that we were very fortunate to host. So please make sure before you leave that you have uh, a, one of each of the handouts. All right. Um, the second thing I want to make sure is that when people registered, that everybody got a raffle number, because we are going to have a raffle. It's really neat. We'll talk about more about that when the time comes. Uh, for those that need to know a little bit about the building, in the back to the right are the restrooms. And I think that's about it. Our next seminar is going to be in August, again, it's on the sheet, so make sure you circle your calendars when you do that. So now I'd like to introduce Carol Monday. She'll give you a little bit of a history of who she is and what she's done, but she's done quite a bit. She's got a great partner, her husband over there, Jim, who I was able to go to their house today, and it's amazing what they've done with wildflowers. <laughs> it blew me away. So they know what they're talking about. So right now, I'd like to introduce Carol, let her take, take you away. And after the seminar, after her presentation, there will be a question and answer period. We ask those that have a question to raise their hand. We'll acknowledge you, come up here so you can speak in the microphone so everybody can hear your question. All right? So All right. without any further ado. Turn that one off. I will. All right. I'm glad you came out on this nice kind of warm spring evening. A lot of gardening going on. And we're gonna flip that on its head a little bit because my husband and I are really into native plants. He's the grower guy. He makes things grow. You could probably just shake him out and something would probably grow. But I wanna to talk to you, I encourage you to use native plants in your home landscape. And I'm not telling you you have to do everything that we've done. I'm just saying you can start small and add some wonderful plants. Um, as Wright mentioned, over on the table are handouts. There's one that looks like this. This is Ohio Native Plant Month in April, and that is a state. That was a house bill that was passed a few years ago. What's not to love about native plants? And on their website, they have a great resource of where you can find native plants. And then there's also a gigantic printout, if you wanted to do that, that's like eight or nine pages that has the list of plants, they're where they grow, what the bloom looks like, and all of that. So there's a sample over there you can look at, but you could find it for yourself. One of the pages includes local growers. Mr. Mundy does grow and sell plants, but there are other growers that are on the list, so they're in that handout as well. And the other handout that I prepared was, um, I borrowed this from um, Prairie Nursery of Wisconsin, but it holds true. Eight reasons not to clean up your garden. That's my excuse, because I'd rather have you know the salamanders and the snakes and all that good stuff. All right, well, people were asking about what that beautiful plant was that's on that page, and that beautiful pink flower, which is actually five or so flowers hanging. So what you're looking at is a wild columbine. The real wild columbine is kind of a red to uh, almost a magenta with yellow, like the colors of fire. They're one of the earliest bloomers, and they're great for returning hummingbirds. But what you notice in this picture is see what looks like a little ball at the very top? That's the nectar. So it's hard for a bee to get up in there. Bumblebees, they think that's too much trouble. They'll just go up there and chew the end off. But hummingbirds will hover at the bottom where the yellow stamens are, and they can put that tongue all the way up into that nectar pot. 
Native landscaping is a great way to reduce the amount of lawn. Are you tired of mowing lawn? Well, then let's talk about maybe reducing it a little bit at a time. You can reduce the amount of lawn, provide beautiful pollinators, have a pretty space, but the other thing you have to decide is how you use your lawn or your yard, and we'll get to that in a minute. I also want you to do your homework. Find out what's native in Ohio. Do we have cactus in Ohio? Evidently, Evidently we do, exactly. Yes, we do. Woohoo! We have one species. Would you believe it? I mean, it was, if somebody asked you if you had cactus in Ohio, they'd be going, nah, you got the wrong part of the country. No, this really cute little prickly pear that grows about this high, well, maybe more, those pads sometimes will get up pretty high, puts off this beautiful kind of a butter yellow bloom with that orange center, and once it's well established, well, that's one way to keep the cat out of the garden, is if you print prickly pear, that'll keep it out of there. But it's great for butterflies, crawling insects will get in there, but you have to be watchful because that bloom only lasts about 24, 48 hours. So you have a super dry spot, lots of sand, lots of sun. Maybe this little cactus will be happy. So why should we consider natives versus non-natives? Well, they tend to be, I'm not saying they're absolutely deer resistant or disease resistant. They tend to be drought resistant. Many of the prairie plants have a very long tap or fibrous root system. So if you're looking at a prairie plant, and uh, something like um, prairie dock, where the shoot might be up eight or nine feet tall with a flower at the top, twice that amount is below the surface. And why does that happen? Because that way it can get the best nutrients and all of the water, even when the top is drought, when it's too dry. It increases the value for wildlife. We all benefit if we increase that biodiversity in plants, and that increases the biodiversity of insects, and we all benefit from that. So we're restoring that diversity. It's adapted to your local crazy Cincinnati weather. You don't have to go out and baby them. How many of you ran out to cover your pansies or early petunias, or maybe you bought impatience because you were impatient and wanted to plant them, and it was too early? They're kind of self-sustaining. They tend to be a little more low maintenance. There's, there's nothing that's gonna be low maintenance except a silk flower, and even that, the chipmunk might take off of it. They generally don't require fertilizer. They're very unique, great conversation starters, and we get a lot of people, I see people walking down, especially when our front yard is in bloom. You can see they stop or they're pointing, and it's like, see, it's working. Suitable for quite a variety of states, uh, sites, and it preserves, again, the native species are being brought in. So here's a real unusual insect. In all my years, I worked for parks for almost 30 years, taking lots and lots of phone calls, and somebody would start with a, a question saying, this looks like a miniature hummingbird. That's actually an insect called a hummingbird moth. They're part of the clear wing family, and you can see it looks like glass on their wings. They're daytime flyers and feeders, which is pretty unusual for most of the moths that we tend to think about. If you're growing, this is wild bergamot, if you're growing bergamot, if you have flocks, they really love some of those great summer flowers that can be right up by the door. So hummingbird moth. Things to consider about your plan. Do you have a plan? Do you need a plan? Some people start very simply. What's the amount of sun that you're gonna have? That's pretty important. So you might go out and look at that spot you're thinking of converting as to what the time of the day, how much sun is, and that may help you decide what types of plants you're gonna be selecting. It also might be helpful to know if there's a slope, there are waters running off where plants could be rushing down as well. Do you need to prepare the site? In other words, do you need to kill off or remove the grass? Are you gonna start with seeds or plants? See, your head's gonna be spinning. We'll, we'll get past that pretty quick. But you know what? Maybe this is what your installation plan looks like. You got the back of the envelope. You're thinking, man, I'd really like to add some wild bergamot and some wild columbine, and just don't lose that envelope. And then you take that with you to all of the plant sales that are happening this spring. Every weekend, there's lots of plant sales. Look for the natives. Some urban factors to consider no matter what you're growing. Soil compaction. 
That means, is it the spot where you're running over when you're pulling out of the driveway? Is it a spot where the kids run back and forth if your yard's being used for the neighborhood baseball or soccer game? Something to consider. It, will it be affected by salt runoff? Some of the natives do pretty doggone well in those spots. Is there reflected heat? So is it next to your house? Maybe it sets up a microclimate where things will grow and bloom earlier because they're taking that heat that's coming off of your house. And then look at the habitat that you're considering. So do you have a woodland? I have a big tree, a couple of smaller trees, and I back up to Army Corps property. So I have both of those regions. You get that edge or transitional zone. So you have the tall canopy trees, the understory, the shrub layer. And then there's their kind of odd, what we would call edge zone. And a lot of the natives will make a very fine transition without looking too weedy. That's a lot of the problem I hear from people. They say, man, they look so weedy. So we need to work on that, change your mind up a little bit. This is what we'd like all of our woodlands to look like. Notice there's no honeysuckle plants. There's no garlic mustard. <laughs> there's no creeping euonymus or any of that yucky buttercup that takes over in the springtime. That's what we really want to look like. If you were thinking about some of the spring ephemerals, hopefully you've heard that name before, but ephemeral means it comes up early in the season before all of the leaves come out. You know that term, making hay while the sun shines? That's what ephemerals do. They pop up when the soil is warm. They're blooming before there's any shade happening from the canopy layer of the trees leafing out. They get pollinated, they make seed, and poof, they die back. And so that's, it's a little bit of magic. It doesn't last very long. There are some things that bloom all season, but ephemerals are rather short-lived. This one is bloodroot, which we happen to have in our backyard. It's really interesting because what you're seeing on this slide is the way that leaf is clasping the stalk. And then it opens up. And once the flower is done, and it's pretty tender, if we have a heavy rainstorm, a gusty wind, some snow, all of a sudden, the, the petals will come off. But then that leaf will unfurl, get as big as my hand, and be up about probably 18 or 20 feet tall. So to give you conversation, even though you don't have the beautiful flower, you still get to see that going on. Things like Dutchman's britches, I think that's one of the first wildflowers my mom ever uh, told me about. And because you're a kid and she's saying, Dutchman's britches? Dutchman's pants? What? It does. It looks like the Dutchman's britches are hanging out there on the line to dry. And again, those are early ephemerals. They're going to pop up through that leaf litter. And I'm underhandedly telling, don't break all the leaves out of the woodland area of your yard, because that's really good for wildflowers. They need that. It protects them. It adds the nutrients back into that soil. And the other, the yellow one that's there, is called trout lily. And trout lily puts up leaves in the first year. And they're about the size of a small feather, about like that, maybe about as thick as my thumb. And the next year, when the bloom comes, the leaves get bigger and they have speckles. They look like a trout in the water. Looking for a ground cover? That's a question I get a lot. Wild ginger makes an excellent ground cover. It loves a kind of a shady spot. Ours is a pretty dark shade. And what's really interesting is that flower is blooming at ground level. It's below the leaves. In fact, there's blooms on the wild ginger that's in the pots over there. So here you have this little thumb-sized flower, the shape of a bowl or a vase, laying right next to the soil layer, below the leaves. And that is pollinated by things like beetles, ants, anything that might be crawling around. So you have to go and look for it. But look at that beautiful shape. It's almost a heart shape. And the stem is kind of a woolly, fuzzy bit. And that will stay green, depending on how hard of a winter, you may still have some ginger plants hanging around. It does have a small, tiny ginger root. Could you use it? Well, yes, but that also means you're killing the plant to get to the root. And it's nothing like the ginger, the, the uh, tropical ginger that you buy at the grocery store. Um, but it has been used that way. Another very early bloomer is this dwarf 
crested iris. You all know what irises look like. You might think about the beautiful bearded iris or the antique or vintage iris that get up about 30 feet or 30 inches or so tall. This one is four inches. It likes lots of sun. And again, it's taking advantage before the leaves come out. The bloom's probably, oh, about the size of a 50 cent piece or a big almond, if you will. Bright purple, like most of the irises that you might know, but the whole thing is about four inches. And then when the leaves come out, the um, plant will die back. The, the leaves of the iris may remain for a while, but you'll only get oh, a week or so with that bloom. If you're already growing flocks in your yard, maybe you have that creeping uh, flocks or garden flocks. This is the wild cousin, wild blue flocks. It gets about, oh, I'd say about 20 inches, 18 to 20 inches tall. It will tolerate a little bit of shade and sun. It's blooming mm, April into May. It really depends. If we get a hot spring, all of these ephemerals will go whoosh, and then they're gone because they, they don't tolerate that heat very well. So they hurry up and grow. They put that wonderful scent out. They get pollinated. They make seed, and then they die back. So you can, you can still so find some flocks around uh, today. Are you growing things like corabels? This is the wild cousin. This is foam flower. There's also alum root and a few others in that same family. Um, they like a little bit of dappled sun. Uh, they will come up and bloom again before those leaves come out. And then when the bloom is done, those leaves will remain. Now this happens to be a bonus picture because we've got this other little guy down here in the corner. This is tall, uh, wild stone crop. This is in the sedum family. Are you growing something like autumn joy? Which is a, it's probably planted out here somewhere. A non-native sedum that gets up about, oh, probably a, two feet tall. This wild stone crop gets about four inches tall stays low to the ground and puts out this really unusual looking line of flowers that looks like somebody drew the letter Y and they're blooming along that letter Y. But native bees, you have to think about the native bees, not just the honey bees, they're not native. The native bees are usually much smaller and so they're gonna be coming into these plants and you want to make sure you're providing for them as well. That's on the edge of the waterfall and next to our little pond. When I was talking about um, edge and transitional zones within your yard, if you have um, a line of trees or woodland at the back, a shady spot, then you can create that transition zone depending on how you intend to use the yard. In this picture, we have grassy spots when we started this, we still had a dog and small kids. <laughs> now we have big kids who have kids. And we still need some grass because what if you want to kick a ball around or play a game? So we do have some grass. And then we put in this zone. It's grown up enough that you don't even notice that edge. And those shrubs have come in. And then this is a little trail that's kind of to the secret garden, which means you have to go in through that pathway to see what you find next. So you can create these different areas depending on how you want to use your yard. I'm not telling you to get rid of all the grass. If you have lots of family picnics, if you have a dog and you need that space, by all means, use it. I'm just asking you to consider natives and maybe start getting them into your yard. An easy thing to do is to add some really wonderful native shrubs. Shrubberific. We're going to go with shrubberific. This one is native witch hazel, the American witch hazel. This blooms in November. After all the leaves have dropped and the twigs are bare, you're going to go out on one sunny morning. I don't care if it's cold, if it's sunny, they're going to be blooming. The blooms look like these funny little puffs about the size of a nickel, and they have a really wonderful, very distinct scent. And the native bees that are still active, I mean, bees will be active at 45 degrees and a little warmer. So they're gonna be utilizing that nectar, and they get pollinated there at the very last minute before the plant goes into kind of sleep mode. 
what a nice surprise when you think about all the other plants that are kind of dying back or going to sleep for the winter to step out on a November morning and see that pretty yellow flower filling that whole shrub. Um, the picture at the top is showing the seed pod. That seed pod is somewhat woody. And as that dries, it will stay through the winter. And once it dries, it's affected by heat and pressure. And all of a sudden, it will pop open. And those black, glossy seeds will be propelled, oh, I don't know, maybe three to five feet from that plant. So it's seeding itself. But I really want you to look at that gorgeous color for the autumn. So now you have two things going on. Before the leaves drop, it goes from green to this really pretty fire color. Those leaves drop, and then you get to see the flowers at the end of the growing season. Oh, that's fine. How big do they get? They can get pretty tall, which hazel, right. But remember, you have the pruners. So if you decide that that is going to be way too tall for your house, you can gently get some instructions so you don't just you know, whack the top off of it. Gently frame it, shape it up, and keep it the way that you want it. You got the pruners. Another wonderful shrub is Carolina allspice, which is kind of a misnomer because you think of allspice being something you can eat. Don't eat this one. <laughs> it's also called sweet shrub. It has a really unique scent. At our house, when it's blooming, and it's blooming now, my husband, my husband calls it the Elmer's glue plant <laughs> because the scent reminds him. It does. It's a, li a little bit like that. It's very, very unique. It's rather tropical looking. Shiny green leaves, lots of wine or maroon colored flowers. Birds will go in there um, and eat the tiny little insects. Hummingbirds come to that. It's a great place for birds to hide even in the wintertime. It doesn't hold its leaves, but it provides enough cover for them. Now this one can get a little more unwieldy. It will get pretty big, and so it tends to want to really spread out. Yeah. So you might think about that as a way of making a living fence that you just trim up once in a while. The funny seed pod up here at the top kind of looks like a cocoon. What happens is the little downy woodpecker comes because an insect is actually using that to put eggs in, not, not a moth or butterfly, but another type of insect. The downy, or, or the downy woodpecker knows that, so he goes and pokes a hole so that he can get to the insect's so in the wintertime, you'll find those hanging, and most of them will have holes in them because the downy woodpecker has already started to eat that. So that one is in our yard. We do have some bluebird boxes. And again, you get some really wonderful fall color that comes on. Spice bush, another shrubberific shrub. It's really wonderful. If you are taking out things like honeysuckle, or some other shrubs, maybe some boxwoods, you're trying to lighten it up. Boxwoods are beautiful, but they're very, very heavy, dense, and really can kind of steal the light out of your garden, and they're not native. But if you're trying to look at plants and shrubs you're replacing those with, then I would suggest something like spice bush. Spice bush starts out in the spring before there are any leaves. There are hundreds and hundreds of tiny little yellow puffs that have a really wonderful aromatic scent. And again, that's one of the earlier bloomers. So you have the native bees coming in. And so they're feeding on that. And it's still maybe 45 or 50 degrees, uh, especially in the morning. And as it gets warmer, then that scent goes out further and draws other uh, pollinators in. When the leaves come on, it's a pretty kind of a shiny green. But the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar eats those leaves, and then when it goes into a beautiful chrysalis, you're going to have spice bush swallowtails. That's what you're looking for. See that funny little caterpillar in the center of that slide that has those big fake eyes? Those are eye spots. He's trying to fake you out. He's thinking, he's thinking you're a bird, if caterpillars think. And if there's big eyeballs looking back, then the bird maybe won't eat it. So that's the spice bush caterpillar. And he takes one of the leaves and folds it up. And he's resting inside there, just like you would kind of make a little sleeping bag and hides in there overnight. And then there's this fall color. 
And I'll tell you, when that goes into that beautiful glowing yellow, especially if you have go into a spot where there's hundreds of spice bush plants, it really is magical with that glowing yellow color. The berries are um, eaten by so many different things, birds, chipmunks, turkeys, um, mice, squirrels, all kinds of things eat that. If you were going to save some seeds, you thought you might plant some the next year, you better hurry up. Because they are red, that is one of the most sought after foods. If something is red, any of the um, berries that are red, that is a sure sign for other animals to go and eat that. So when you're thinking about saving some seeds that you might plant, do it quick as soon as they turn, because otherwise they'll get eaten. Let's shake it up a little bit. Let's look at vines. Vines, sometimes vines get a bad rap, don't they? You think about a native vine like Virginia creeper, people have a problem with Virginia creeper. It's not toxic, it has five leaves, but it's kind of looking like poison ivy, which by the way is also native. It provides for wildlife. You and I might really hate it and be mad at it all the time, but both Virginia creeper and poison ivy are native plants and provide for wildlife. This particular plant, this vine, is called cross vine, and we are on the northern edge of its habitat. It's a woody vine, perennial, so it, it stays throughout the year. And as it grows, it has these lovely tendrils that will stick out. And they're reaching for the next layer. And right now, it's starting to bloom. The blooms are about three inches long. They're a tubular shape. They're orange and yellow, somewhat reminiscent of trumpet creeper, if you're familiar with that one. This is a good plant for things like uh, the hummingbirds are back. We saw hummingbirds on our, uh, for, or our cross vine this morning visiting that. In about five seconds, we saw a hummingbird in the front yard visit three different plants. It was wonderful. This plant, when we first got it, the very first place we put it was by a tree, didn't have enough sun. Well, Jim built an arbor uh, near this other little pathway that I showed you. And once it got the sun, there were hundreds and hundreds of blooms. Now we have it in the front yard. He built a teepee that might stand, oh, maybe eight feet or so tall. It's made out of uh, rebar. It's our Christmas tree. So the vine has gone all the way up there. We do put lights in it in the wintertime. But it's so beautiful when the bloom comes on to see that it's quite striking. So that's something to consider. Um, and it will, in some winters, it will keep its foliage. And the leaves that remain over the winter get a dark purple on the back. So you've got green on the front and purple on the back. It's really quite pretty. Ours made it almost through the season. We had that last hard freeze probably in March, and it just that was, it took care of them. But it's all come back now. It looks great. Are you looking for a living screen? This is purple passion flower, native to Ohio. It grows quickly when it gets hot and lousy. <laughs> Think about those really yucky, hot, humid days that we have in Cincinnati in July and August. This plant loves that weather. It goes so crazy at our house, it will run under the little bit of grass and come up, so we're mowing it. In the picture that you have here, we would have it go onto this trellis and just make a living screen for that summer, and it would be covered with these big purple-shaped flowers. Lots of little, the petals are almost tendril-like. Great for bees. Bumblebees especially really love it. And we get a caterpillar called the gulf fritillary, which is an unusual occurrence that's happened probably two or three times. We haven't seen the adult, uh, the adult butterfly feeding, but we've seen the caterpillars eating the plant. So you gotta, it's a little game of give and take. If you're going to plant for native wildlife, they're going to eat it. So you can't have your feelings hurt too much. Once the um, plant has uh, been pollinated, then it's going to be putting on these funny, they're called may pops. They look about the size of a lime. And they are a passion fruit in the same family. But there's so little flesh inside that compared to a passion fruit that you might buy, say, at Jungle Gyms or a specialty market. Um, they're great for kids who want to stomp them because they, they make a pop. Raccoons, skunks, squirrels will eat them. 
Doesn't it look like something tropical, like it should be in the Crone Conservatory? You could have that in your backyard. It does, once it starts to grow in that hot part of the summer, it goes like gangbusters. But again, you have the trimmers, or you can weave it in and out. That's what I do on that edge here. I'll tie up some other strings and kind of keep you know, rearranging it a little bit. And if it gets a little too out of control, I just start snipping it back. Yep, that's really an unusual looking plant. Some other very simple things to grow. This is called wild geranium. And if you're working with the geraniums you usually grow, they're not cold tolerant. This is a colder tolerant plant. It is up in April. Sometimes we have bloom in April. It's blooming like crazy right now. It's probably about knee height. In fact, this picture down here is the front of our yard. It kind of looks like that right now. That's right underneath the main window. It's great for butterflies, hummingbirds. The butterfly moth, if they're around, will come to that. And you might get a second bloom. So we have this big surge of bloom about now. Then it, the flowers will be gone for a little while. The leaves persist, so you have that nice ground cover at about knee height. And then you'll get some spotty blooms here and there. It won't be quite as prolific as what we're seeing in the spring, but you'll get a few. So if you're looking to cover an area in mass, this is an easy one to do. And here's another example of that, things like this Canada anemone. And both Canada anemone and wild geranium are on the raffle table. So this Canada anemone grows in such an unusual way. When we decided to put it in the front yard, we cut it like a piece of sod. We cut it into blocks and transported it. And it grew like crazy. It's wonderful. It has that beautiful stark white flower, kind of reminds you of a um, strawberry flower. And it's about the same height as that geranium, so about knee height, well, knee height on me, I should say. And it's gonna be really busy here, and you may have some bloom well into the summer. It does well, this is in an open spot of the yard, which has now changed, you'll see that here in a few minutes. It does fine until we get into that really hot, dry period. And that's when it looks a little peaked. So if you're already watering something else and this gets watered, it will remain green and lush the rest of the summer. That's kind of what it looked like. Yeah. So we used to have the silver maple tree like everybody in the neighborhood had a silver maple tree and kids climbed in the tree and fell out of the tree. And so then the tree died and we started putting more and more native plants in there. Let's talk about sun lovers. So prairies and meadows and tons of sun. You don't think about Ohio being a prairie state, but it is. It's at the very tip of what they call the Prairie Peninsula, which starts way over on the edge of Pennsylvania and starts to widen out, heading out to the west, where you think of prairie areas. Ohio has lots of native prairie species. The two in this are things you already know, purple coneflower, which I know you can go to any hardware store or plant sale and buy so many different varieties of purple coneflower, but I'm gonna tell you those have been tweaked and twisted and turned and they're not the native stock. So you may get that beautiful tomato red color. I think there's one called tomato soup and there's one called mac and cheese. It looks beautiful for a few years and then it starts to die out and it may even revert back to its native form, which is this beautiful, dark pinkish purple with giant heads on them. I will tell you that in a prairie, you notice there's lots of other friends around to help hold things up. And that's a better way of doing it. You want that diversity. If you go to a place where you see a bed that is all coneflower, let's say this half of the room is all that purple coneflower, those head cutting beetles are gonna have a field day. And it will look like some vandal came through at night and clipped the top of that beautiful flower and now it's hanging over the next morning and it's a little tiny weevil that goes up, she snips almost all of that stalk, puts her eggs in the rest of it and lets the other part hang which is a signal to all the other insects that might have used it to say, sorry, nothing here for you. 
But if you have these diverse areas where you've mixed up these species, they'll have a better chance. Here's blue false indigo and white false indigo. They are another plant that likes to have their friends around because they tend to droop a little bit. We have them on the side of a house. And on some cases, because they're on the side of the house, they do this. They're leaning out. So you might add some other structure if that's a place you're going to be planting them. They also have a really interesting seed pod. At the end of the growing season, when the seed pod forms, it looks like small rattles. In fact, if you brush next to it, it sounds like that. So it's a pretty interesting flower to have. That's where it is on the side of our house. And you can see where it's a little skinny spot. That's what was there when we moved in 30 some years ago. And so sometimes the flowers tend to lean towards the sun. This plant we do not have at our yard. We'd love to. We keep trying. This is called prairie dock. Does anybody still grow elephant ears? You're probably familiar with those. And you have to, they're beautiful, giant leaves, but you also have to baby them. You have to dig them out and dry them out and store them and then put them back in. Well, if you switch over to prairie dock, you won't have to do that. Prairie dock gets up about, oh, maybe waist high on me, and you get these giant rough leaves, and then it sends up a stalk that might bloom at eight or nine feet tall with a sunflower at the top. If that's not a showstopper, I mean, I don't know what it is, those giant leaves, you're going to have your neighbors saying, what is that? And you don't have to dig them up or baby them because they'll be ready the next year. They do well in an area that has good moisture, but they're also very drought resistant. They're a prairie plant. They have roots that are very deep. Most of their biomass is below the surface of the ground. So they're well suited to those droughty conditions. Certainly, you'll get a better bloom if you have more moisture. It needs lots of sun, though. It likes that hot, stinky part of the summer. Some more prairie plants. You um, know Blazing Star. Occasionally, you may have bought a bouquet of flowers, and it has what they call gay feather in it. That's what it is, Blazing Star. There's a number of varieties. This is another one that likes to have some of its friends from the prairie in that same garden, or it will lean over a little bit. But it is really heavily visited by many different pollinators, not just bees, but lots of butterflies. And as you move into that very hot season, here in the uh, end of the summer, you want to make sure you still have lots of blooms producing nectar and pollen for that end of the season rush with the pollinators. This one is called Queen of the Prairie. Um, we have it in the yard. It hasn't bloomed. I think it's got too much shade. It really needs the sun. But think of a flower that's about this big. It looks like cotton candy. I mean, that's the color. It's about the piece of cotton candy. And it will do fine if it's very wet or even in a little dry spot. But for the best bloom, you have to have a very sunny place. The leaves will be up, oh, anywhere from three to five feet tall. And then the stalk might be five feet or so. So again, this is a pretty good showstopper if you want to include that in your yard. <coughs> Lots of talk about milkweed. I'm going to just talk about one. I think there's 11 varieties in the state of Ohio. Butterfly milkweed gets all the credit, but there's all these other milkweeds that you can consider. And if you've talked to your neighbor and they say, I don't want those milkweed fluff blowing into my yard, you have the scissors. Go out and collect the pods if that's a way to resolve some of that. Even if common milkweed pops up in your yard, same thing. You can cut those pods off so that you don't have that fluff blooming. Now, you might give that pod if it's developed enough to somebody who wants to grow milkweed for butterflies, especially. And again, this is a plant that has now been tweaked. You can go to the garden center and buy pink ones and red ones or white ones. But I'm telling you, stick with the native. It's longer lived. Once it gets established, it's longer lives. It likes that really hot period of the summertime. It's not as big as the rest of them. But that color, that super dark red orange, is really wonderful. Yes, it is visited by monarchs. You need milkweed to provide for monarchs. But milkweed also provides for many other creatures. Many other insects are going to be visiting that plant. This one is called cardinal flower. 
It will come into bloom in late summer. It is the best color of red that I can think of. It's really the most wonderful color. It likes it a little more damp, but it will tolerate this dryness. And we have some pretty bad soil around Forest Park, for sure. Once it gets established, it will spread. And so you have, this is a perennial. It's going to come back and drop seed. You'll have lots of other visitors coming to it. Red flowers are excellent advertisers in terms of bringing in pollinators. They tend not to have the highest quality of nectar. White flowers have the highest quality of nectar. And as we move to the end of the summer, I don't want you to bypass, forget, or talk badly about things like asters. Um, asters grow where asters want to grow. We have that argument at our house every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Somebody's pulling out asters because they've popped up in the wrong spot. This is the New England aster, which can get about as tall as me. The flowers are about the size of 50 cent piece and are very aromatic. And it is a pollinator of magnet. If you have any of the asters, ironweed, even that white snake root that blooms at the end of summer, goldenrod, those are magnets for that late season pollinator. They're trying to get as much nectar and pollen consumed to set aside for the young that may be resting over the winter or to provide for their hive if it's something like a honeybee. So what does your landscape plan look like? Do you go to every plant sale? Maybe you go and you say, I'm not going to buy anything. I'm just going to look. Does that ever work? <laughs> and then you have a driveway or the back of your car filled with buckets and quart containers that might sit there for a while. I like this one. Do you have OBD, overbuying disorder? Or the best is, so you've got all the pots, and you lost the tag, and you don't know what it is. We, sometimes we, ha we just wait until it tells us what it is eventually. It will. OK, so we've renovated this yard a few times. And in 2021, Mr. Mundy did it again. We pulled up everything that was there. Now, this soil has been building and building for quite a number of years. And he's been growing these plants. So all of the plants that are in there are things that he grew. So that's June of 2021. Here are some of the main players that he incorporated. And on the table, we have frostweed, which you'll get to see the magic that frostweed does here in a minute. Lots of water, because it's all new plants, hot season. This is July, one month after things were planted, and that's October. Let me see if I can go back a minute. So there's July. There we go. <laughs> Now, I will tell you, we did not plant that crazy petunia. We don't know where it came from. It was happy. It grew. And then it was gone. But look at the size of those coneflowers. Some of them were as big as my hand. And to think that that went in in June and started with plants that were this big. So see, you can do that in your yard. OK, let me tell you about this unique plant called frostweed. White wing stem, and you can kind of see on the stem, there's these flef, uh, fleshy edges of the stem. But the real magic happens at the end of the season. Another reason not to clean up your garden. Frostweed, the sticks, the remaining stems have dried. Don't take them away, because they may have insects that are resting, important, necessary, good bugs. Those stalks are drying but there's still sap in the roots of the plant. The first hard frost that comes in November, this is what happens. That uh, sap through capillary action is drawn up back into the stalk. The stalk has split because it has water in it. And as the sap hits the air, these wonderful curls of frosty hair ice come out. And the idea that you can see that starting from November through February or so. It's not as good as the first few times. By February, you might only get a little bit above the ground. But that's part of the reason we don't clean up. I mean, you would never see that. If you took all of those stalks down, 
Sometimes we're too worried about cleaning up after that garden. It's going to be just fine. Let the things rest. Let the insects be under there. That also feeds the birds that are going to come in during the winter. So whether it's a dried um, seed head that was on the top of the plant. So this is another nectar provider. Or things like cone flowers or brown, brown eyed Susans, when those seed heads dry, instead of you going and clearing them out, you've got all of these birds, our winter resident birds, coming back to eat those. That's pretty magical. Here's a little picture of the, our winter garden. Isn't that a pretty spot, a nice snowy day? We have a tiny little pond that's there, and uh, we have some wonderful um, concrete pieces. My grandfather was a statuary maker here in Cincinnati years ago, and so we have some of his pieces. OK, a couple words of caution. Places not to get plants or seeds. Don't go into county parks or state parks or national parks. Don't go onto private property without permission, and that includes um, if you happen to see an area that's being destroyed and you can feel your heartstrings because you know there's royal catch fly or wild blue phlox in there, don't ask the guy on the bulldozer. He'll say yes. He's not the owner of the property necessarily. Go find out who the property owner is. Make an arrangement. Maybe you actually get a notation from them that says you have permission to dig these plants. And if you're going to be digging them, dig as much of the soil from that plant instead of bare rooting them. And nurseries with shady business practices. And I would say that's if you go on the internet and you find something like lady slipper orchids for $2, guess where they probably dug them out of? Smoky Mountains or something like that. So yes, we have native plants for sale. You can buy a few or buy a carload. There's, that's Royal Catchfly. And um, is that Ohio spiderwort, Mr. Mundy? Or is that the other one? I think there's one Ohio spiderwort on the raffle. Yeah. yeah, great. Do you want to learn more about wildflowers besides coming to a talk like this? Get some good wildflower books. I know everything is on the internet. That's fine. I need a book in my hand. I want to be able to write notes in it. I only have one copy of this. This is from the Division of Wildlife, State of Ohio Division of Wildlife. I did ask to have copies for tonight's class. They're not printing them like they used to do. So I didn't get any, unfortunately. That's why I put together that booklet for you that's on the table. Here's another really good one. This is Wildflowers of Ohio. This is written by Robert Henn. He lives right here. This is the second edition. This is some easy. Um, Easy reading and good stuff to have. So you could have something like this by the back door where you're watching birds before you go out into the garden to get some examples. And then if you need some more convincing, I highly recommend this one is by Doug Talame, Douglas Talame, Bringing Nature Home, which tells you why you should care about native plants and all of the wildlife that will be drawn into that and how important that is. And you can also get those at the library. So other things you could do, sign up and go on a wildflower hike. Your local parks, the Cincinnati Nature Center, the Cincinnati Wildflower Preservation Society, Cincinnati Chapter of Wild Ones, they're plant people, not motorcycle riders. Well, most of them, I would imagine. Um, there's lots of wildflower talks. There's an annual, annual conference held just up the road in Dayton every year by the Midwest Native Plant Society. You can go and visit the native plant farm that is owned and operated through the Cincinnati Zoo, Boyer Farm, up in Warren County. You can practice with your phone using some plant apps um, for ID. We don't use those. People ask us all the time, what app do you use? We don't. We puzzle it out on our own. If I can't get it, I ask old what's his name. If he can't get it, then we have other botanist friends. You can join the Midnest Native Plant Society. You can follow them on, your, on the Facebook page. I mean, even just doing that, not a lot of commitment, but you can see the posts of their members of their club that they're out walking in wonderful areas of Ohio, edge of Appalachia, arc of Appalachia, any of the native preserves through the state of Ohio. 
Nature Conservancy property, and you wouldn't have had to leave the house. You can be looking at that in your bunny slippers and your bathrobe, looking at flowers from all over the place. Again, like I said, books, it's hard, it's hard to beat a good book. I, I think having a book is important. All right, as I mentioned before, April in Ohio is Ohio Native Plant Month. And if you go to their website, they are a great resource because now they have an interactive map of nurseries across the state of Ohio. So you can look at the little pins, click on a pin, and see what they have available. It gives you the address and phone number, website, all of that kind of information. OK, now that I filled your head with all kinds of native plant information, I guess we're going to go into some questions. So I think Wright wants to, yeah, we got, we got to wrap this up. We'll have some good questions. And then we can go into the raffle. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm just fine. Good. Well, I was just wondering, because I'm all about native, um, but I also have dogs. So do you know what plants are native to Ohio and are also are toxic to dogs? It's not that hard to find out. OK. OK. Um, there are plenty of veterinary medicine sites, or you can send me pictures. There, there actually is, it's funny, the question is worried about toxicity to dogs especially. But there is a group from the United Kingdom, the UK, and it's called Emergency Poisons Help. It started out mostly about fungus, but they also have reached out to botanists all over the world. And if there has been an ingestion situation, they're not looking for just ID, but if you have an animal or a human that has ingested something and you have a photograph of what they ingested or what they coughed back up, you can post it there and they will get you information immediately. But if you have plants, you have a question, you can send it to me and I can help you with that. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and having pets with these plants, for the most part, what we did when we started that garden, we did have a dog. And what we did is we added a little fence that he could have easily jumped over. But it was enough for him to kind of understand that that wasn't for him. Either that or we just got lucky. But he did pretty well at staying out. And, um, we knew he needed space to run, so we still had all those grassy areas. And at that time, we didn't have anything along the other fence because he was friends with the dog in the next yard. So they needed that space open, and we didn't plant so they could play. Good question. OK. I'm not going up there. Anyway, everybody, can you hear me? I wanted to make a, plot, a wildflower garden, uh -huh. but then I found out I was just going to throw some wildflower seeds out there. Yeah. But they said you have to take up the sod and all that and prepare it? Correct. Yeah, well, see, that's what's stopping. OK. Because I can't pay somebody to come and dig right. up the sod, you right. know, cut it up. So OK. Well, let's start with, there's a couple questions in there. So number one, if you go and buy wildflower seeds or you get meadow in a can, it's probably nothing from the state of Ohio. It may bloom for a year or two. It's going to be mostly duff and vermiculite. So you might get this much seed in a big can. And it, like I said, it might look pretty for a year or two. You get some cosmos, something like that. What I would suggest is find out about getting some native seed and then start small. And instead of you trying to get the sod up, just go out with some heavy cardboard or black plastic and tack that down. Let nature take its course. It's going to kill that off. You might have to wait a season. You don't have to be in a hurry. Once that's died off with a, a good rake or Get a neighbor or somebody else to come and just rake that spot, but start small, because you could easily overwhelm yourself if you thought you were going to do the whole garden in one fell swoop. Right, right. Yeah, so start small. And you could go so far as to buy a native plant seed mix. For instance, Ohio Prairie Nursery up in, they're in Hiram, Ohio. But if you look at their website, and it's on the list if you got the handout, they have mixes for pollinators, shady areas, uh, rain gardens, and they will put that mix together, and you know it's a good quality seed, it's meant for Ohio, and all of the directions are right there. So once you have treated that spot, let's say that little blue square is going to be your first garden, and once you've killed off that grass, we know how hard it is. I mean, believe me, we, we know how hard that is. So just start small with what you think you can work with, and that way you can also be very, very picky about the plants that you want in there. So tall things in the middle so they don't overcome. Keep it 
Keep it light and airy and sunny and you'll be in good shape. All right? More questions? Their, their heads are filling, they're too, too filled with ideas. No. Yeah, don't, don't beat yourself up about, you know, our yard has taken 30 some years. We've been working on a little bit here and a little bit there. And how many times have we redone the front yard now? Three, four? I mean, that's what life is. You adapt to that change. The tree dies. That's a big change. Then you grind out the stump. Then you're going to wait. Then you're thinking about what you want to put in that spot. And then a few years later, you get some other ideas, and you change it all out again. Right? No other questions? Mm. I think they, it's what? not a question. OK. Um, when, years ago, I was driving down Winton Road over the bridge and up the hill going south. And I saw this yellow in February. And I said, what is that? And I, years later, figured out it was um, witch hazel. Uh -huh. So for Mother's Day, five years ago, my kids bought me a witch hazel tree. It blooms in February, right? not the November one. That right, and that's one of those tricky things. There are, are two different varieties, and then there's all those other cultivars that are out oh, yeah. there. So if you go with the traditional um, American witch hazel, that's going to be the one that blooms in November. Okay. And then there is another one that blooms in February or March. And that has a little different color and shape of. Yeah. I, we had a talk once, and he had some that were um, short petaled and some that were red. Or dark kind of a coppery color, yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's the plants, the plants people, <laughs> the nursery men and women who really thrive on tweaking that. You know, you think about flowers that have double ruffles and all of that, but we're trying to go back to, the yeah, the original, yeah, what was here in Ohio, right? Yep. I think that's worth bringing up. OK, so shall we raffle some things off? OK. Uh, I will let you draw. Uh-oh. Am I shaking these up? You can. All right. Uh, just a little information. Whoops, is this on? It's on. OK, just a little information about the raffles. If you look over there on the table, you will see plants. These plants were grown and nurtured by these two individuals. All right. And there is some information for each plant. And I encourage you to talk to Jim over there uh, after the meeting if you want to find out a little bit more about the plants or the seeds that you won in our <laughs> fantastic <laughs> raffle. All of the plants that are over there are perennials. So that means that you put them in and they will come back next year. Um, the information that's on that card goes home with you. If you have questions, you can email. Uh, my card is up here. It has the crow on it, and Jim's has the heron. If you have a question about how to grow those things, you can email one of us, and we'll make sure and get back with you about it. All right, there you go. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Again, if you have any other questions, our information is in that handout. Or pick up a card. If you didn't get a copy, here's the handout that has pictures of a lot of the plants and information about them if you need that. Thank you for coming out tonight. And make, make sure that you have a copy of the, all the handouts. And uh, I think there's contact information that if you want to give her a call somewhere down the road to help you get started, please do. All right, have a good evening. Thanks for coming out.